It's good to see each one of you here this morning. Hope you've had a good week. And uh, I asked last week uh, before we dismissed the service uh, if each one of you would really pray and uh, not only pray, but invite someone, especially someone that uh, you think there it might be a chance that they're not saved, or it might be someone that's never made a profession of faith, and they they show no interest in it, but uh, I, I hope you did. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. It's not my purpose to embarrass people, but I hope everybody could raise their hand and say, yes, I've been praying every day this week for the, for the service today, and I've really tried to bring someone with me. Uh, I hope that's the case. I sent a message to Brother Kenneth last week, and as most of you know, I'd planned on preaching a short series from the book of Acts, and uh, all of a sudden, all of that changed, and I, I sent Brother Kenneth a text saying, really, pray for my messages the next several weeks, and uh, referred to the fact that uh, I'd asked folks to be praying, and uh, I told him I have a heavy burden on my heart to preach what's coming up, and I, I can't really explain it. I just know from for many years of experience now that whenever God puts that burden on your heart, uh, that's what you need to preach. And so I'm glad you're here, and I hope you'll be praying not only today, but uh, praying uh, all week long. And I'm going to do something today that I normally don't do. If you know me, you know that I, uh, I generally uh, use a, an alliterated outline, so like the old timer said, those points, you know, it gives you like a, uh, a peg to hang your hat on, and it makes it a little bit easier to remember. But today, I think it would just maybe confuse things, and so uh, we'll just have one of those fireside chat type things. And I often think about Jesus, it's where it says he sat down and he taught them there. There wasn't any grand pulpit for him to stand behind. There was no sound system for him to use. And I'm quite certain that he, uh, he wasn't trying to impress them with his great speaking ability or any such thing as that. It was just uh, kind of a one-on-one -on -one message with each and every one of them. And uh, sometimes we preachers tend to get carried away, and whether we admit it or not, we, you know, we want the sermon to be impressive to people. Uh, we, our real desire should be for it to be effective for people and helpful to people. So whenever the Lord laid this message on my heart, uh, I, I was thinking about a particular text that I'll get to in just a minute. And so in my record book, I look back to the last time that I'd preached a message from that text, and it was five years ago. And not that I'm not preaching the same message, but I was just curious as to how long it had been since I'd used that. And so uh, I ended that message with these words. We need to strip away all of the religious garb and get back to the simplicity of Christ, just Jesus. And that's the title of my message this morning, Just Jesus. That's the only thing I'm taking from that other message. Basically, I just, because those two words describes exactly what I want to speak about today. And, you know, having the Bible in our hands, which is a wonderful privilege, isn't it? Because a lot of folks don't. We have the Bible in our hands, and if we take the Word of God and use common sense reasoning you would think it might be easy to convince people of their need of Christ. I mean, that's what you might think. If I just have a tear in my eye and if I'll give them a hug and show them I care and take the Word of God and, and help them to see their need, that, that might be kind of simple, but it's really not that simple. And here's the reason. While you're dealing with that person, you need to understand that someone else is dealing with them also. Someone else is trying to keep them from Christ. We have an adversary, Satan, who's called the God of this world, and he is determined to deceive and dis to destroy souls. And when you consider the natural condition of man, I mean, we're, we're all born into this world, and this is the way all of us are before we're saved. We're spiritually dead. 
we are deceived. We are blind to the truth. And it, listen, it takes a miracle for anyone to ever be saved. And man's only hope is found in the Word of God and by the work of God. And to sum all of that up, it would be just Jesus. You know, we hear so much talk today about fake news and disinformation. And by the way, that's serious stuff. It, it can have an influence on many lives and even on a nation. It's serious, but there's something much more serious than the fake information that we get from the television and from the newspapers and other places. And that is the devil's deadly deception. His evil work is more devastating than absolutely anything else. In fact, you could say that religion... Religion is man's greatest enemy. Now, we normally don't think of it like that. We look at some religious group. I mean, they might be far different than we are. And we might think of them, well, bless their heart. You know, they're, they're sincere. You know, I don't agree with what they believe. I don't agree with what they do. But they're, they're sincere. And they're certainly not any, any threat to me. They're not my enemy whatsoever. But if you look at the facts of the matter in the light of God's Word, you'll see that religion, man-made religion, is indeed our enemy. It's our enemy because it gives people a false sense of security. It, you know, it makes them feel, well, I don't need what you've got because, hey, I'm okay. I'm, I'm all right. That's what I told that guy, the first guy I'd ever witnessed to me in my life in high school. Nobody had ever talk to me about being saved and he tried and my response was I'm all right like I am just leave me alone I, I just wanted to get away from him as quick as I could I'm all right I, I'm, I'm okay I, I don't need anything and that's the attitude of a lot of people but whenever people become religious that is whenever they hang all of their hopes on some particular religion all of a sudden, they have this false sense of security, and they become the hardest people on earth to reach. And as you've heard me say many times, it's a lot easier to reach the drunk down there on a bar stool than it is an unsaved church member sitting in a church pew. Because the unsaved church member might indeed believe that they're saved and they're on their way to heaven when in reality they're not. Most of those folks have their mind made up they don't want to be confused by the facts. And, uh, and by the way, they're not exactly happy about it. If you might even suggest that they might not be saved. You say, well, I would never do that. Well, if you preach the gospel, you might have to do that. Because nobody's going to be saved. So first of all, they realize they're lost. And here's the problem. In this day when people no longer no longer believe in absolute truth. By the way, I shared with our Timothy team yesterday the Gallup poll and the Barna Research Center and Lifeway and different places take polls and surveys that only 68% of the pastors, or 68% of the pastors, different denominations in America, only 68% uh, or 68 percent do not believe God's word is is the Bible is literally God's word. Well, I don't know what in the world they're doing preaching unless it's just to draw a paycheck or to become famous or something. Wouldn't be no need preaching. I'll tell you, if any part of the Bible isn't true, you can't trust any of it. And if you can't trust any of it, you might as well give up on this Christianity idea because it's all based on deception. Now, here's the problem. When someone says to you, but you've got your truth and I've got my truth, and, you know, you're welcome to that. One person's truth is just as good as another, and they don't understand how narrow truth is. They don't realize that there's no room for error, absolutely no room for error. Some say, well, you know, you can't be sure of anything, and they believe everything is relative, of course, and they say, you know, what they believe is just fine, and especially if you're sincere about it. You know, it just, it's just got to be all right if you're really sincere, if you really believe in it. I shared with the guys yesterday about Oxford 
uh, dictionary in, in 2016, their word of the year was post-truth. <laughs> like there is no such thing as truth anymore. We're living in a post-truth age, according to them. And now that is a word, and it, it, it expresses the philosophy of many people. And in my opinion, there's never been a more confused generation than this one. I'm not saying that's true of all of them. we got some wonderful Christian young people here. But as a whole, there's never been a more confused generation than this one. And I want to remind you, this is not a new problem. It's not something that just started recently. Yesterday, I shared with the guys some historical things about... Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but it was kind of how we got where we are spiritually. Went back, you know, all the way to Spurgeon and then to Moody and brought it down through the years and just uh, how the easy believism philosophy came along. And that was the big thing uh, years ago, back in the late 50s and early 60s. Just get a profession of faith out of people. Just get them to repeat this prayer after you. And, and that means they're saved. So all of a sudden you've got churches that are full of unsaved people. And then the church growth sees that. And the church growth, a guy by the name of Donald McGavin, he writes a book and starts a school about uh, church growth, the church growth movement. And it's all about using different techniques and what have you to cause churches to grow. So now you have larger churches full of unsaved people. And what a sad day that we live in. But listen, the same thing to some extent existed in Paul's day, especially when it was in regards to the matter of salvation. Look in 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, and I'm going to begin in verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, who in presence am among, am base among you, and being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as, as if we walked according to the flesh. Now, let me stop there a minute. Whenever you read through this chapter, you probably, if you've never read it before, you're going to be really confused by some of the things Paul says. And you have to understand that the folks there had been under the influence of false teachers, and now the same people, the same people that at one time respected Paul, now accuse him of lying and being in air. And so it's as though he, Paul is writing back kind of tongue-in-cheek. Well, for them it would be sarcasm, you know. The, the, but it's the irony in which he speaks here. So whenever he says, I boast to myself, understand he's not really boasting about himself. He's just saying that to, to show them how they're treating him. But here's the text, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Well, I'm in the wrong spot. Verse 3, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ. Don't hear much about that today, do we? You know, of all of the problems today, the most serious, as I said, has to do with religion. Religion has complicated things. Some folks who consider themselves to be great scholars, you know, they know the Hebrew and they know the Greek and, 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 and maybe have a brilliant mind, by the way, and a vocabulary that they use words that I can't even pronounce. And so... Uh, they act as though that uh, that the m most of us, you know, are just too dumb to really understand unless we sit under their ministry. Oh, you, you could you could never get it, you know. I, my main problem with Calvinism is the fact that, and by the way, I've been more around more Calvinists than than I think probably anybody here because. 
When I moved to Cincinnati, I was called upon to address the issue, even though I didn't want to, and the preachers were all called together, and I did address the issue, and I wasn't very popular with them, but let me tell you, one of the biggest problems with them is they think that they are spiritually superior in understanding, and the rest of you, a bunch of dummies, haven't figured it out yet. One of them asked, well, what do you, what do you, what do you think about it? What do you say about it? I said, I kind of agree with David over in Psalms 139. He couldn't understand it, and if he couldn't figure it out, I doubt if I can. And if you think you got it all figured out, you're confused. Because there are mysteries and things about the ways of God. Somebody says, well, the fact that God knows the future, doesn't that make it so? Didn't he predetermine that's the way it's going to be? They've got all kinds of arguments. What I'm saying is, folks, listen. What I'm saying is, and I told someone this last week, the thing that bothers me is they have, not just them, but others that have that attitude, have so complicated things that what is, what is the poor old farmer, someone like my daddy that only went to the eighth grade, they can read English, you know, of course, barely, but they only went to the eighth grade, what are they going to do when they open the Bible? Could they ever find out the way to salvation? I mean, is God complicated it so that, that even if you can read the Bible, it's just too hard to figure out? That's kind of the same attitude you know the Catholic Church had, right? I mean, they told their members, don't you, don't, you, know, you even read it, don't try to figure it out. That's our job. That's for us to tell you what it means. Well, I don't think that's what God intended at all. I think God was communicating with us. And He does so through the Word of God. If you want to know what God thinks, read the Word of God. If you want to hear God speak, read the Word of God. So here we are living in a society that is totally confused, complicated by religion, leaving billions in a state of confusion. People that absolutely don't know what to think. And for the most part, we're like those mentioned there in Romans, thinking themselves to be wise, they've become fools. You know, I shudder to think what a person might find when he walks into the average church today looking for help and looking for hope. Now, remember, Paul is writing this out of deep concern for these people. He loved those people. He was helpful in, in establishing that church there at Corinth. And so he is broken hearted when he sees what is going on and, and they've been deceived and the evidence of it is clear. It's not like he's taking a wild guess that you might have been deceived. You might be wrong. He has evidence that they've been deceived and the nature of it is extremely serious. Someone had confused them by complicating things. If you want the details, just read the entire chapter, and it's all there. These false apostles had come in. They convinced some of the members that Paul is wrong and we are right. And uh, in verse 2, I, I, I love what he says there about speaking as, a, as though he is a jealous father of the bride. He's trying to convince them, look, I want what is best for you, just as a father is you know, jealous for the bride, you know, to make sure that she has the very best in life. And that's what he's telling them here. But then in verse number four, notice verse three and four, he's warning them here of the deception and the danger. Verse four, for he that cometh preacheth another, another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. He's letting them know that this has become a warfare. It is a warfare between those, you know, that are trying to deceive them and Paul. And he mentions the fact here that, that just just as the devil deceived Eve, that these false teachers were deceiving them. I, I fear lest by any means, 
Notice, as the serpent beguiled Eve, how did he do it? Through his subtility. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in the gospel of Christ. Well, you say, well, what in the world does all of that mean? Well, you think back to the story of Adam and Eve, and there they are in the garden, and the serpent disguises himself. He comes along as a serpent. Now, remember, at that time, back before the fall, there wasn't any venom in the snakes. There wasn't any fury in the beast. They didn't have to worry about anything like that. And the serpent was something rather charming to her. And all of a sudden, uh, there's a conversation going on between her and the serpent. And I want you to notice what happens here as he deceived her. In verse number 1, he says... Yea, have God said, that's the first thing he did was to question God's word. Hath God said, and notice next he changes God's word. He says, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, he's changing what God said. It's not what God said. Then in verse number four, he denied God's word. He says, ye shall not surely die. Remember, God had warned them. You, he said, you can eat all the trees except this one tree, and you eat of that, you're going to die. And the devil's now denying that. And then in verse 5, he replaces God's word by saying, Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, that hadn't worked out very good, has it? And that is exactly the same way that people are deceived today, and that is through the word of God. That's what Satan does, but notice how he does it. Look on down in verse number 13. He says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. His ministers. Do you know Satan has people in the ministry? I'm talking about people that profess to be Christian people. Christian preachers. They'll tell you God has called me to preach. God put me in the ministry. They'll use all of the right terminology. When in reality, they are there as an ambassador of Satan for the purpose of deceiving people. Now, looking back at Paul's situation, the danger that this church was in basically came from two places. Number one, these false teachers had to do with the legalistic Jews. And they taught that, you know, you have to keep the law in order to be saved. I mean, if you're you're going to go to heaven, look at God's law. You've got to do this and you've got to do that and you've got to do the other. Keep that. You'll be all right if you keep that. Problem is nobody can keep the law. Nobody. And James says, if you offend him one point, you're guilty of all. You know, you can sit there and say, well, I'll tell you one thing. I'd never do this and I'd never do that. I'm not that kind of a person. Those wicked, evil people that do all of that stuff, they are so rotten. They deserve to go to hell. Let me tell you, if you've sinned in one point, you're already guilty enough that you are condemned in the sight of God and headed toward the devil's hell. And there's not one person here that can say, I've never sinned. I've never sinned. And so these legalists, and you say, well, I don't think we got any of them today, do we? (laughs) Or they might go by a different name, but they're in all kinds of different denominations. Some of the people you, you meet from some denomination that you're familiar with, and you're so nice to them because you, you might say something like, well, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm a Baptist. I'm an independent, unaffiliated Baptist. I, you know, I, I sure don't agree with you, but, uh, but, but I really respect you. You're just you're such a nice person. And then you go around telling other people, and I've heard it. I've heard people say to someone else, well, I, I know yeah, he's a church of Christ, but I, I believe he's saved. Or he's a Catholic, but I think he's saved. Well, they're not saved if they believe what the church teaches.
Look, we're afraid to call a spade a spade nowadays. You know, we say and we know that a person can't be saved until they realize they're a sinner. But when it comes to the denominational lines, we are scared to death. I'm talking especially about preachers scared to death to address that issue that those people are just as wrong, just as guilty, just as dangerous as the Muslims. Why? Because what they're teaching is contrary to the Word of God. It's deceptive. On the other hand, in addition to the legalists or the Gnostics, now these are the people, the Greek Gnostics, and they taught all kinds of mysterious doctrines about Jesus. You know, uh, things that supposedly could only be understood by those who are really enlightened. Oh, they've got that elite class of religious people. The very word Gnostic means knowledge. And these people put a lot of emphasis on experience. Even, uh, you know, meditation is one thing, but when it comes to occult-type meditation, it's a horrible thing. They believed in this kind of meditation and chanting, mysterious revelations and things like that. Oh, I, I know this is the way it is. I know that's not what my preacher says, but I know it's this way because I... I had a dream, and boy, God worked me over, and God told me this, and God told me that. When people start telling you that God's talking to them, I mean, talking to them, you say, well, what do you mean? I mean, they claim they hear God's voice. Why? I, I read God's Word. I read what God says. Oh, you say, preacher, you'll never understand. You have to have the experience I do. You have to go through what I did. Oh, you would then you would understand. Now, it doesn't make any difference what stripe they are. It doesn't make any difference what particular brand of religion they are. Any religion that teaches people that you've got to keep the law to be saved or anyone that says it's too deep for you to understand, I'll be praying for you until you have this religious experience and this awakening and and uh, you better run there are so many folks that are deceived and led astray either by the fear that they must do something to be accepted by God or by their feelings you kind of leave the impression that if you haven't had a Damascus Road experience you're not saved I got news for you. You don't have to have a domestic road experience like Saul did in order to be saved. You're not saved by doing good either, like Judas. You ever thought about Judas Iscariot and how here, three years, he's following Jesus around. Nobody ever questioned whether he was saved or not. I mean, that's a pretty good cover up, isn't it? And nobody ever, they bickered among themselves, the apostles did, but nobody ever said, you know, I think, I think Judas is a traitor. I, I, I don't think he's, I don't think he's saved. Tells me he was up front, out in public, doing better than some of the others were because nobody questioned him. And there are folks today, you know, that can, like Judas, think, if I just do good, I'll be in church every Sunday, I'll do this and I'll do that. Nobody will ever wonder about whether I'm saved or not. But, you know, the Bible says the devils also believe and tremble. You see, you can't even be saved by just acknowledging the historical facts. You can say, well, I I believe in Jesus A lot of different religions do. I believe in Jesus, and yeah, of course, I celebrate. I celebrate Christmas every year, so I think, yeah, yeah, I guess he was really born of a virgin. I believe he lived a good life, and and I know, I, I know he died on that cross. My mama has a picture of it on the wall. 
And I know he must have been raised from the dead because we celebrate Easter. We even had the Easter bunny come over. And, uh, and you see, they've got it all figured out, supposedly. They acknowledge the historical facts. And yet at the same time, they're no different than the devils who believe, but they tremble. Listen, the only way to be saved is what? To be born again just as Jesus told Nicodemus. That's the only way, the only possibility and to be born again. You have to see yourself as a needer, uh, uh, as a sinner in need of God's forgiveness. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what the Bible says. One of my favorite stories there in Acts 16 in the jailer. You know the story. Paul and Silas in the prison, they're singing praises and praising at midnight when most of us would be moaning and groaning and singing the blues. They take that bad situation and turned it into a glorious opportunity. And when the prisoners heard them, can you imagine what these other prisoners are thinking? Listen to those guys. They, they just got beat up, blood running down their back and what are they doing over there? Singing praises to God and they're praying. That must have been an impressive sight to anyone. And then God began to shake the place. That was the jailhouse rock. God started shaking the place and set them free. And boy, Paul and Silas could have said, Hey, looky here, the door's open. Let's get out of here. But they weren't looking for a way out of the prison. They were looking for a way into the jailer's heart. And they stayed right there. They didn't run. They knew God was behind all of this. And the jailer come running in. The same jailer that was about to kill himself, by the way, comes running in and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Boy, Paul has a great opportunity, doesn't he? This is just what he's been looking for. Somebody that wants to know how to be saved. That's exciting for any Christian, for someone to say, how, how, do you, how do you become a Christian? How do you get saved? How can I get my sins forgiven? And Paul said, believe. That's all, all he said. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. No, oh, by the way, it'll work for your whole family. Believe. In Acts four twelve, Peter said, Neither is there salvation in any other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that's why Paul made this statement in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And dear friends, that's what I meant whenever I quoted how I concluded a sermon five years ago, that we need to strip away everything religious, everything that isn't scriptural, and get back to the plain, simple message of Christ crucified and risen from the dead. Back in the 1950s, the famous German theologian Karl Barth was over here lecturing at the University of Chicago. And uh, one of the reporters there asked him this question. He said, what is the most important, important, most profound truth you ever heard? And Barth thought for a moment and he replied, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Folks, it doesn't get any better than that. Jesus loves me. 
And I know because the Bible tells me, though, and that's what I'm talking about, folks, that when you strip away all of the religious garb and you get back to the simplicity in Christ, it's what? Just Jesus. Man's problems are serious. Life is difficult. Our needs are great. But the solution is really very simple. It's just Jesus. Remember what he said there in the upper room, John 14, 6, For I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And all you need to get it all, all he has is faith. It can't get any easier. It can't be more simple than that. And don't listen to those that say otherwise. Don't listen to those that say, well, yeah, you've got to believe on Jesus, but you've got to join the church. You've got to be baptized. You've got to be a good person and so forth. And don't get mad at the preacher whenever he calls them out on their air. At times that we have to speak out against those that pervert the gospel. Paul sure didn't back down. Over in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, he said, I marvel. Now, this is a different congregation, but listen to what he says. I marvel. I'm, I'm amazed. I'm flabbergasted. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now, if that wasn't pointed enough, he repeats it in verse 9. As we have said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. I mean, Paul didn't pull any punches whatsoever. Because he realized how serious this situation is. And in this confusing age in which we live, we need to understand that as Christians, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is just Jesus. My heart breaks for those who have been deceived into believing a lie. Sincere, maybe, but just ignorant of the truth. Now, that lie might have come to them from someone who meant well. It came to them from someone who, someone that was deceived, them, deceived themselves. I mean, after all, it had been handed down. To my great-grandpa, he was a Baptist or whatever. It's, that's what we've always been. Someone that really meant well. But that doesn't make it any less dangerous. And if anyone tells you that salvation is Jesus plus something, don't believe them. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. If that's what you're depending on, you are just as lost as the worst sinner that you can imagine. You know, if we presented to God everything that we have, gave Him every last drop of material things, money, and if we could give Him a list of all of the good things that we've done, it would never be enough. But for God to know that our faith is in that blood that was shed on Calvary, God says, swing wide the gates, let him in. That's all that it takes. If salvation comes by Jesus plus good works, how would you ever know whether you're saved or not? It would be impossible because you never know how much is enough. I'm so glad I can say with Paul, and I know many of you can, most of you can, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Wow. 
I know there are those that tell you, well, you can't really know for sure that, that you're going to heaven. Well, Paul knew for certain. That's what he's saying there. He, he, he didn't say, well, I think I might or I hope I do. Let me tell you, you can have the same assurance that Paul did if you believe John 14, verse 6, where Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. You see, he is the one, he is the eliminator of religion and, the, and, and he is the exclusive one when it comes to redemption. And that's what makes so many people angry. They say, well, look, it's all right. I don't care what you believe, how religious you are, what denomination you are. Uh, just don't say we're wrong. Let's just all get along. That's what's going to create the one world church, by the way, this idea that let's just all get together and forget our differences and all, all come together. That's exactly where we're headed I'm glad I don't have to be a millionaire. I'm glad I don't have to be highly educated. I'm glad I don't have to have great talent that people would boast about. I'm, I'm glad it's not a matter of how religious I am. I, I'm glad that I can know it's just Jesus. And that's when the world rears up on its hind legs and wants to fight. When we say it's just Jesus, if you don't trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. Oh, the politicians throw a fit about that. They want it to be, you know, you just include all religion. All you have to do is be religious and you'll be okay. But Jesus said, I am the way. I, I love that verse. It's one of the seven sayings there in John where Jesus uses that phrase, I am. You know, he could have stopped right there. He could have just said, I am. I am. I'm the one who created and controls the world. I am the one who can say from the guttermost to the uttermost. He's the God that created you. He's the God that was crucified for you. He is the God that cares for you. And someday he's going to call you home. He's the way without any exception. He is the truth without any error whatsoever. And He's the life without end. Let me ask you, and I close this morning, do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that if you died today, you'd go to be with the Lord? Now, I realize if somebody walked up to you and they said, uh, are you a Christian? You'd answer yes, just like that. But I'm talking about in the depths of your heart. Do you know that you're a child of God? Do you know you would go to heaven? You see, there's some folks that have been doubting their salvation, whether they're saved or not, and it's gone on for many years in some cases. They're too embarrassed about it. I don't really know why, but it embarrasses them to face the reality of it. They're embarrassed so they don't want to tell anybody because it's easier to just keep pretending, covering it up, acting like everything's okay. You know, they might even be thinking, you know, I guess it's just normal for people to, even good Christians, it's just normal for for people to sometimes doubt whether they're saved or not. And they keep trying to push those doubts out of their mind, but it just keeps haunting them over and over and over again. Oh, they'll go a few hours or a day and not think about it, but they're at night with their head on their pillow and they're reflecting on things. And all of a sudden... They might think about a message, Brother Kenneth Preacher, the Sunday school lesson that they heard from one of the teachers, and they begin to wonder, am I really saved? Would I really go to heaven if I died? Let me tell you, listen carefully, that's not normal. That's not all right. And you will never be at peace until you deal with it, and the only 
way to deal with it is faith in just Jesus. It's the only way to deal with it. You say, well, Christian, don't you think somebody could doubt their salvation? Well, yeah, you could fall off a horse and hit your head and you wouldn't know your name or your address. But not long term, you're not going to go through life years on end wondering, I wonder, boy, I hope, I, I hope I've got this right. I, I hope I'll go to heaven when I die. Oh, I could stand here for no telling how long telling the stories of those that many of you right here. I remember when Peggy got saved. I remember when Jason, my son, got saved. And different ones here that people that were good church members. Several years ago, I was preaching a revival and uh, just in a little town outside of Springfield. And I preached a, uh, an entire week. And I, at that time, I was preaching a lot of revivals, and so I just kind of crowded in my schedule, I thought. And at the end of the week, they said, uh, could you preach a, another week? And I said, well, I could. I don't, I don't know whether I can rearrange the schedule to, to do it. And and finally, I prayed about it, and the Lord gave me peace. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll preach another revival. So we went into the second week of revival. And lo and behold, when it was over, and God, God was blessing, but when it was over, they said, we want you to stay for another week. I said, I don't know. I've never preached a three-week revival I'll pray about it, think about it, and I did, and the Lord said, yeah, stay with it. And you know, at the end of that week, one of the pastors there, I think he was working with the young people, he was an assistant pastor working with the young people, gone to Baptist Bible College, passed all of the tests there, End of that week, the invitation was given. End of the third week. And he came forward. And he poured out his heart. That although he felt that God had called him to preach and he had got an education at Baptist Bible College and so forth, that he didn't have any peace about it. And finally God had convinced him that he was not even saved. And he was saved that night. Most all of you have heard me tell the story about Bev, and I won't repeat it today. And she's not the only preacher's wife, by the way, that, that I know of that was saved. I could name others that during revival meetings that ended up realizing, you know, I'm not really saved. But what about you this morning? You see, God knows what's in your heart. And believe me, whenever it came down to doing that series on Acts like I had planned, I thought God wanted me to do that. And I mean, God turned me around on a dime and said, no, there's some other issues I want you to preach about. And this is the first of those messages. Let me tell you, God doesn't lay a message on a preacher's heart unless somebody needs it. Now, I'm not the judge. I can't tell you whether you're saved or not. I understand that. But I'm going to tell you what I believe. I am 100% convinced in my heart that God put this message on my heart, directed me, led me, impressed me that this is what I ought to do because there's somebody here that's not saved. And it may be several somebodies. I don't know. Only God knows. But could it be you? And you can go on pretending and acting like everything is all right. But God knows. And deep down in your heart, you know something's not right. Something's not right. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, all things become new. And you say, preacher, I, I never had that happen to me. 
And over and over again, whenever you're not trying to even think about it, all of a sudden the Spirit of God will begin to convict your heart about the fact that you've never really trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'm going to encourage you to do that this morning. I want us to just, you don't need to stand yet. I want us to bow our heads. I want every person here that knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're saved, I want you to really pray right now. And if you're here today and you say, Preacher, it's time for me to get honest. And I'm going to deal with it this morning. I'm going to trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I am so tired of fighting these doubts. Right where you are. You don't have to walk down the aisle. You don't have to pray a prayer out loud or anything like that. But right where you are. You'll say from the depths of your heart to God, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I want that peace, what the preacher's talking about. I I want that assurance like Paul had. I want to know that I'm saved. And right here, right now, your spirit has made me realize that I'm not going to heaven. I'm not really saved. And right now, I'm trusting you, Father, to save me because of what Jesus did. During this time of prayer and silence, would you do that right now?